Hi, it's Frankie DeVita with 95.5 KLOS, and I'm here at, with Chris Cornell at the Warner Theater in San Pedro on his solo tour now, um, promoting your new album, Higher Truth. That's right. You got it right. Okay, so what I want to know is Higher Truth has kind of a positive feel to it. Is there something spiritual behind that? No, not really. Um, and I say, I'm quick to say no, just because I think the, the idea of spiritual is... A, sort of a strange one <laughs> to me like it, it it kind of suggests that you're you're considering something that might exist past sort of what we know is like the physical world and and um i don't know I, to some degree i guess i take that for granted and then um most venues and most groups that that use the term spiritual or spirituality um i can't stand any of them so uh, uh, th that's why I just qu quickly jumped to no, that has nothing to do with <laughs> there's no spiritual anything um, what is that higher truth? to me it's the, it's the kind of uh, the simplicity of like that banana over there <laughs> um, which uh, is pretty amazing and that, that sounds like a stupid thing to say but it's true, it's pretty amazing the, 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 how it got here and um, or just um, you know what always occurs to me is children having children, watching them grow up um, seeing them as babies, taking this almost kind of smug uh, sort of superior attitude that the adults take around children as though they're smarter while, you know, observing at the same time all of the areas where children are actually much smarter than adults and, and the big smart adults not really seeing it. And it's that, that sort of simplicity, it's that banana that's in front of you. It's that they're living in the moment and seeing everything sort of that is right there. They're not complicating anything. They're not preoccupied with things that are completely unnecessary. Therefore, they're kind of there and open to see sort of the the miracles of life. Like when I was five, my fifth birthday actually, on my birthday, um, was the day that men first walked on the moon. And I remember thinking that uh, that sort of became part of normal life. Like, wow, this is the world, this is life, this is living. Stuff like that happens, and then a guy goes to the moon, and then cool stuff. Um, that's sort of where we somehow take a left turn. That's where we, um, that's where we somehow manage to focus an incredible amount of resources and energy on useless stuff that doesn't mean anything, like following... Um, celebrities that are celebrities for the sake of being celebrities and buying magazines that they're in and spending hours of the day thinking about who they are and what they're doing and what clothes they're wearing and what songs they're listening to and who gives a fuck and by the same token um, we're still sort of participating in a system that ecologically is slowly but surely um, destroying everything and everyone can say that everyone kind of knows that even the naysayers sort of have to believe it at this point but nothing's really changing um, and that's all you know that's just kind of the the a strange thing to me I see um, I see sort of the simple truth in um, a baby in in simple things because they're taking them simply and they're finding like a universe in something that's very small that's very simple that we all take for granted um, that's much more important than what some idiot is wearing on a red carpet um, so I guess that's kind of it to me and that isn't a, a spiritual thing for example if like you and me and this nice gentleman holding the camera if we when we die there's nothing left no memories we don't exist anymore it's lights out it doesn't make um, where we are and what we're seeing and, and what our experience is less important or less amazing. It's still just as incredible and just as miraculous. Uh, so the idea of spirituality, the idea of um, a disembodied spirit, the idea of something going on outside of this, um, it's nice to think about it. It's great if it's there, but, but it doesn't have to be for us to, to give a shit about how miraculous the world around us is and what's going on right now. So is that... You, so you're out of time, no more questions. We had... We, well, no, I love it. I yes, love... about songs. <laughs> well, th what I'm asking is, I mean, that was 
that was a very nice definition of what your the title of your album is. Is well, yeah. are those things part of the songs that develop that album? I don't probably yeah. I think that there's a the, the whatever part of my personal philosophy came out just now. That's in there too. It always comes out. Um, you know, I try not to. I, I try not to write songs that I believe are just like my personal philosophy. I'm also not like that. that kind of songwriter that necessarily believes in you take a backpack and a guitar and you wander the earth and then you write a song about every single thing that you see I'm kind of more just live a normal life um, and and absorb it and then this it'll all kind of naturally come out in the songwriting process and don't overanalyze whatever that is um, I watch a lot of documentaries on different songwriters one of them that's really interesting is Bob Dylan because he's he he doesn't over really over explain anything and when he talk when he talks about different periods of his songwriting and talks about doing it it's kind of like yeah just get up and write some stuff <laughs> that's that's it really and um i think what comes out is a combination of fiction um you know an imagination uh observation person and personal experience and and uh so do you think your daily life is a songwriting process um, no, I'm not sure I understand that question. Is it just, you said it's life and living, and so when you're going about your day and you're doing your thing and you're with your family or you're out with your crew or whatever, things happen and those bring lyrics or thoughts or I think emotions to mind. Five months later and I'm sitting and writing a song, something that might have happened today could sort of come out in that, in a sort of natural way. Like, it's like an osmosis thing. Um, like when I'm writing songs for a new album, oftentimes I notice that there will be reflections of things that happened while I was making the last album. Um, I've joked about it before. I say, yeah, the, usually my album is the diary of what I was going through when I was making the last album. Um, as opposed to that immediate thing where... Um, and I've been asked this, you know, like, you, I get in a car wreck and like, you know, everybody's okay. And I'm right home and write a song called I Got in a Car Wreck. <laughs> um, sometimes that's really great and I'm not criticizing it uh, but I think that's that I don't really do it that way something just sort of occurs to me um, and then I kind of make sense about it and then looking back on it later it usually mm, makes itself known that it's about certain experiences and certain thoughts that I've had and a lot of it's thinking thoughts that I've had that I then sort of remember um, but uh, my version of songwriting has always been do a, do whatever it takes to make it happen and be happy with what's happening um, and try not to overanalyze it try not to try not to try to intellectualize and understand what it is how you do it and why it works when it works um, the only thing I will do is like when I feel like it's not working I will sort of try to analyze that sometimes I guess but um, it, it's a. Uh, I always felt like it's kind of whatever. Try anything. Sleep, no sleep. Food, no food. Um, substance has never really helped. But if it helps you and doesn't kill you, then whatever. If it works. <laughs> well, I, I uh, saw recently, I read recently that you said. Um you can identify yourself more as a solo artist now or you can identify as a solo artist because of the solo albums that you've put out. I, I think that this this type of touring um, where it was solo acoustic and like f f for several years now just kind of a one-man show um, and drawing all of the songs that I've written for previous bands and solo albums and then movies and all that together kind of under one umbrella and one approach, which is acoustic songs, um, they all kind of then belong, they all kind of suddenly get into the same family and then it makes sense. And then I can sort of feel like, oh, that's my solo artist identity. Because it is a weird thing. Normally when someone becomes famous for being part of a band, and in my case, you know, fairly prolific band, and then what ended up being two fairly prolific bands, um, to take the individual out of that is really hard. It's almost like you're, oh, I'm going to see a show from that guy that fronts those two bands. And, and it's not, I'm going to see that guy's show. 
and you, you're sort of expecting to see that guy kind of do a review and there's so much of what I've done and you know three different bands and and so much different solo stuff that stylistically is all over the place that um, it, it's sort of difficult to to connect the dots to what all that is and I think these acoustic shows have done that for me and so Higher Truth really is the album that was born from that the album of original music that was born from that sort of more or less in the style of that so I know that you are um, you're already in talks or maybe possibly songwriting by now for an upcoming Soundgarden album uh -huh. how do you leave that um, yeah, solo identity <laughs> solo identity at the door when you go back to working with a band um, well, because the band is part of the solo identity, I don't really have to think about it. It's just, what, what happens is I'm thinking about writing songs, and, and I'm thinking about co-writing songs, and I'm also thinking about writing songs for this image, this attitude, this understanding that I have of what Soundgarden is. Um, for me, it all comes down to escapism, and that's how I approached being a fan of music from a, a very little kid. I wanted to go into, into my bedroom and listen to records. Um, didn't really want to listen to records with other people so much. Uh, I didn't mind sharing, but that wasn't really the point. The point was that I was alone listening to music and, you know, laying in bed, closing my eyes and getting lost in the experience of it. And so to me, um, whether it's my own records or my own song or a sound garden or audio slave or temple of the dog or whatever it might have been or is now um, to me it's this it's this f fictitious environment it's like some universe that is created as though i'm a novelist right creating characters and a and a town and an environment placed in a time um, and then when I'm writing the songs or playing the songs or listening to the songs, I get to go into that world. And so if it's Soundgarden, it's that Soundgarden world. And, and it's solo we, get to, we get to sort of continue to create it. We're now we're writing, it's like as if we're creating new parts of that universe. So are you actually in the writing process with them now? How far into that are I'm you? Just, I'm talking to you guys, but... <laughs> Um, we want to know what's going on with the next uh, uh, album. Yeah, we we started working right away. I, the funny thing about m putting out albums is like the, the Higher Truth. I've finished writing that long time ago. <laughs> it, was, it was months and months ago, and then I was making the record. So as far as writing songs, I've moved on since then. And Soundgarden is the, the same players. All the same boys are back. Oh yeah, we wouldn't do it ever if it wasn't all the same people would ever. Are you going to return to the same studios that you just did Higher Truth in and the uh, Soundgarden albums before? Um, well, I did Higher Truth in a different studio than... than uh, I worked in a studio that Soundgarden's never worked in. So, and I'm not really sure wh what, wh how we'll record or where we'll record, but it'll probably be some, something similar to what we are comfortable with. And one more thing. So I hear that you have decided to be your own stuntman. Um, and you just got burned recently? Yeah, that just sort of... I don't know if I'll be in a position to have to worry about being a stuntman at <laughs> any time. But yeah, that happened. Was that kind of like a macho thing? I'll just do it on my own. I'll do my own stunts? No, I think it's a budget thing. There wasn't, <laughs> uh, it wasn't anyone else around. <laughs> I think that makes more yeah. sense. Yeah, there was it's like... What, uh, and I'd sort of... I'd written the plot. So it was like, I, this has to happen. No one else is going to do it. I had to do it. So, you know, there's no one telling me what I had to do. It was, Kinda. Well, I think they're telling me to wrap it up, but I do, I do want to ask you one more thing about uh -huh. the uh, Chris and Vicki Cornell Foundation. And uh -huh. can you tell me something about that? Um, well, it's, it's a foundation that kind of started with the idea of helping um, at-risk youth and sort of funding different organizations that we saw already successfully did that. And so we started focusing on a couple of different orga organizations in Seattle. Um, and we're kind of b trying to branch out and spread that out, but that's basically the focus of, of what it is. And in, in the position that I, I am in, I've been asked to do a lot of different benefits for a you know, ton of different causes. And, and a few times, uh, Vicky and I had seen it done really well, where um, 
you know, it was something simple, but a lot of money was raised to help a really good cause. And then we, and then I participated in a couple where um, it wasn't really, and, and so we kind of decided, well, let's let's use um, my celebrity and the fact that I have a fan base in an effective way to uh, to try to try to help some some kids. And um, and then we went, we met a lot of people and kind of learned. Um, what are the most effective ways to do that? But the the beauty of it is, is that I essentially don't do anything different. I'm going to do this anyway. Um, it's it, like a, a celebrity, for example, going out and playing a show and performing for a, for whatever kind of charity it is. Um, they're not they're not dragging bricks up a hill. They're d they were going to do that that night anyway. Right. So it's like real easy for me. Um, so the idea is just to recognize that and then realize that, that I'm in a, a privileged position to be able to help without really having to go very far out of my way and then make sure that I'm consistently doing that. Because one day I won't be able to and I'll have wasted that opportunity to, to, to help and, and to help some, some children that need it. Well, I think it's great that you're using your celebrity for that. And I uh, just want to thank you for spending the time with KLOS. And thanks for uh, coming to Southern California. And I can't wait to see you tonight. All right. Thank you.